So, Assalamualaikum, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Karachi, Pakistan. On behalf of the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture, CBEC, at the Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplantation, a WHO collaborative center of bioethics, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. Now, this is our second uh, webinar in the series of three, and it is uh, designated uh, for the dissemination of WHO guidelines for the uh, ethics of uh, vector borne diseases. We started the series with a meeting uh, for the Emerald region, and now we are for the, uh, here for the Afro uh, region of WHO. And the third one will be the final one for the Wipro and Sierra region. Uh, while the world <coughs> has been focusing on COVID-19, other public health challenges have not only remained, but they have also actually grown. One such challenge is the threat of uh, the vector borne diseases and general population health. And given the wide spectrum of strategies that we have at our disposal at trying to counter these vector borne diseases threats, there are also a variety of ethical challenges in applying these um, uh, strategies. And hence, um, the WHO guidance document on the ethics of vector borne diseases. We have an excellent panel of speakers uh, with us today, whom I'll introduce shortly. But before that, uh, there is a, um, uh, some broad <coughs> outline for, the, for this engagement. So speakers will each have about 15 minutes uh, to deliver their talks, and we'll be happy to take questions after each talk directed to that particular speaker. And after that, we'll have a general question and answer session for the entire panel. <clears throat> the participants are requested to send in their questions uh, in the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom right side of the page uh, of this Zoom application. Uh, they will be compiled by my associate, Swaliha Shekhani, who will then put them up for the panelists to discuss. So um, we will start today's proceedings um, with Dr. Andreas Reis from WHO headquarters. Following him will be Carl Coleman from the uh, uh, Seton Hall Law of School. He's a professor over there. Then we have uh, Professor Joel Aik. Joel is uh, in the Environmental Health Institute uh, at Singapore. And Francine Nitomi is a professor at um, the Colonies Foundation of Medical Research in the Republic of Congo. And Professor Diki uh, Akimori is uh, uh, from the WHO Regional Office of Africa. So we have an excellent panel of, of specialists who will deliberate on the various ethical aspects and technical aspects today. So we'll start today's proceedings uh, with uh, Dr. Andreas Reis, who has led this project and has also masterfully coordinated the various members of this um, committee tasked with the responsibility of developing the guidelines, drawing on each of our strengths. Uh, Dr. Andreas Reis <clears throat> is the co-lead of Health Ethics and Governance Unit in the Res uh, Research for Health Department of the Division of the Chief Scientist at WHO Geneva. After medical studies and practice in internal medicine in Germany, France, and Chile, he pursued studies in health economics and obtained a postgraduate degree in biomedical ethics. His main areas of work are in the areas of public health with a focus on ethical aspects of infectious diseases and outbreaks in, of emergency emerging pathogens. He has lectured and organized uh, trainings uh, for WHO in more than 50 countries and including at CBEC in Karachi, where we had the pleasure of having him for our module. And he's also served um, on various editorial boards, including Public Health Ethics and the Monash Bioethics Review. He has published widely and is a co-editor of three books on bioethics and public health. So um, over to you, uh, Andreas, for your uh, introductory remarks um, uh, about uh, our seminar and also uh, the process of the uh, guidelines development. Thank you and a warm welcome to everyone from WHO headquarters. I also first want to thank our speakers for their availability today and especially also Amir Jaffrey and uh, Dr. Moazam um, from our collaborating center in uh, Karachi for bioethics for uh, facilitating these uh, uh, implementation seminars of the WHO guidance document on ethics and vector borne diseases. I think uh, most of us are um, very much busy with the COVID uh, response uh, and have uh, 
been uh, devoting most of their time to COVID in the last couple of months. But I think it's very important for WHO to insist that other um, health challenges have uh, remained and need to be urgently addressed. Just a few days ago, there was a, a report coming out of WHO which uh, uh, clearly stated that malaria, for example, will probably kill more people than COVID-19 in Sub-Saharan Africa this year. And, and there are many uh, other vector-borne diseases that continue um, to uh, cause very high mortality and morbidity. Um, most vector-borne diseases actually are neglected diseases. But I would argue that um, even for the discipline of ethics, vector-borne diseases have been quite neglected until recently. Um, and uh, interestingly, this topic of ethical issues in vector-borne diseases was first uh, prominently raised um, in a meeting in Africa in 2012, uh, when the Global Summit of All National Ethics Committees took place uh, in uh, Tunisia. And the National Ethics Committees of Africa got together and established a small working group um, because they were saying WHO has so far addressed tuberculosis and HIV from an ethical perspective, but uh, not malaria and, and other vector-borne diseases. Um, but it wasn't until uh, the WHO resolution in 2018 on vector-borne diseases that this uh, work really started in, in serious. Um, and this WHO resolution explicitly called for addressing also the ethical issues in relation to uh, vector-borne diseases. And so um, between uh, 2018 and 2020, we uh, worked quite hard with an expert group, uh, which included um, uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Aik and Dr. Jeffery and, uh, um, and uh, Dr. Coleman as a lead writer to uh, establish these WHO guidelines, which we are happy um, that we published them uh, just recently. And I hope that uh, with the seminar, we can uh, go a long way mm -hmm. to contextualizing um, this guidance and uh, hopefully facilitate the implementation at country level. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the talks and the discussion. Thank you, Andreas, for your introductory remarks. So we'll go on to our uh, first speaker, who is Professor Carl Coleman. He'll be talking about uh, giving us an overview of the guidance documents. As, as Andreas said, he's actually uh, been the lead uh, writer for these uh, guidelines. Professor Carl Coleman is Professor of Law at Seton Hall Law School and a core faculty uh, member of the Seton Hall Center for Health and Pharmaceutical Law and Policy. Before joining Seton Hall faculty, he was executive director of the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law, an interdisciplinary commission charged with developing public policy on issues raised by medical advances. He has served as, bio, uh, as bioethics and law advisor to the WHO in Geneva and as a member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protection of the US government's Health and Human Services Department. Professor Coleman has authored numerous articles in leading law and health policy journals. He has received his JD Magna Cum Laude from Harvard University, Harvard Law School, and holds an AM in East Asian Studies from Harvard University and a BSFS Cum Laude from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Services. So uh, over to you, uh, Professor Coleman, for your talk. Hey, thank you very much. Um, let me just um, get my slides, um, show my slides. So, give me one second. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to um, do a very brief overview of the um, of the WHO report as a background to some of the um, discussions that will follow. Um, just by way of general introduction, as as you probably all know, um, uh, vector-borne diseases are human illnesses that are caused by parasites, viruses, and bacteria. The key is that they are transmitted um, by vectors. So there's a broad range of vectors that transmit 
um, these illnesses. Um, mosquitoes are um, the one that's most often discussed, but there are other vectors as well that can be very important in transmission of disease. Uh, the major vector-borne diseases account for approximately 17% of the global infectious disease burden and cause more than 700,000 deaths per year. So these are very um, significant diseases. As Andrea said, and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to in a moment, um, these are typically neglected diseases. Uh, the WHO guidance, you see the cover on your screen. Um, this guidance was developed in response to a specific request by the World Health Assembly um, to issue guidance on the ethical by vector control, uh, vector-borne diseases. Uh, the primary audience for the guidance is people working in the field of vector-borne disease prevention and control. Um, but the guidance is written in a, in a general, um, general language that provides enough background uh, for people who are not experts in the field to also um, um, get um, a, a good understanding of the issues. So uh, the first question that we addressed in the guidance is why are ethics important in the field of vector-borne diseases? Uh, you might say ethics are important in all aspects of um, public health, but uh, vector-borne diseases raise ethical issues that are particularly unique in certain senses. So the first point, um, this comes back to the, the issue of neglected diseases. Um, Vector-borne diseases are neglected diseases, and they have a disproportionate impact on the world's poorest populations. Uh, this neglect um, manifests itself in a number of different ways. Um, the, the most um, concerning way is the lack of attention to the development of measures that might um, affect um, and improve the situation. So, um, for example, the development of drugs, vaccines, um, and other vector control technologies. So one of the major ethical issues in vector-borne diseases is addressing um, both the disparate burden of the diseases and the neglect um, that, that comes from that. The second point is that because vaccines or drug treatments exist for only a few of the pathogens transmitted by vectors, uh, the primary method for controlling these diseases is to use population level interventions that address the vectors themselves. So for example, efforts to reduce the population of mosquitoes in a community. Uh, the, the, the ethical challenge of these interventions is that they require, in order to be successful, the participation of either the entire community or a very large um, segment of it. And it's often not possible um, to get individual consent from all the individuals in the community because they have to be implemented on a community-wide level. So you have situations where you may have interventions that are being um, implemented in a community, um, but not everyone in the community feels that they, um, that, that they might accept those interventions. In addition, while the goal of the intervention is to benefit everyone in the community, the benefits might not be shared equally by everyone. And at the same time, some people may burden, uh, be burdened from these interventions more than other people. So you have a potential for a um, mismatch between the benefits and risks among certain segments of the population. So these are all very challenging ethical issues. Um, the final reason that ethics is a particular significance in the context of vector-borne diseases it, it has to do with the nature of some of the newer vector control methods that are being researched, which involve the genetic modification of vectors, particularly mosquitoes. Um, these interventions have the potential to be very beneficial, but they also involve um, a lot of uncertainties, including potentially um, long-term and irreversible risks. And um, there are just so many unknowns in this field um, that um, that itself creates um, ethical issues. How do you, how do you regulate and oversee um, an area that involves so many uncertainties and so many unknown risks, and especially when they may not be reversible? So with that general background, I thought I would go through a few examples of some of the ethical issues addressed in the guidance. Um, and there's, there's not going to be enough time in, in this brief overview to actually uh, resolve these issues or discuss how the, um, the, the, the guidance um, attempts to resolve them. But I just wanted to lay out um, as, as illustrative examples what some of the issues are, which will give you a sense of the breadth of the report. So one set of issues involves vaccine campaigns and mass drug administration. And these are kind of the classic um, 
community level, um, population wide interventions I was talking about um, before. So one question is, um, can it be ethically appropriate to offer financial remuneration or other incentives to encourage participation in these kind of um, public health interventions? And there, um, there are examples of this being done in various parts of the world. And there are those who feel that this is um, a potentially very effective way of getting greater uptake. Um, there are others who feel that maybe it's not so effective. And in addition, um, it, it potentially um, raises ethical concerns um, about exploitation, about um, undue inducement, et cetera. So this is one um, set of issues. Um, related set of issues is um, whether it is acceptable to implement these programs when some of the recipients um, may not receive direct benefits. Um, so this is an issue that comes up um, in a number of public health situations. Uh, vaccination is, is a classic example of this where uh, the benefits of vaccination may go to the individuals who are vaccinated, um, but the larger goal of it, the overall purpose of it is to benefit the community. And there may be some people who don't receive any individual benefits from either a vaccination or a drug administration, mass drug administration um, program, um, and they are assuming a risk, um, really not for their own benefit, but for the benefit of other people in the community. And, and how do you address the ethical issues there? Um, what is the role of informed consent in these programs? Must individuals be asked for informed consent? Um, if not informed consent, are there alternatives like notice followed by the opportunity to opt out? Um, or are these the kind of programs that should just be um, implemented um, on a mandatory basis? Um, is it appropriate to track individuals during vaccine campaigns or mass drug administration programs to ensure that optimum doses are taken? Um, tracking can be very important from a public health perspective, but there are issues of privacy um, and there are issues um, about um, particular burdens on certain um, segments of the population, those who might be more concerned about being tracked, such as people um, whose status in a, in a country may, may not be um, regularized. So if, uh, people who are not there um, legally may be very concerned about being tracked and that information perhaps being used against them um, in other ways. Um, so these are all issues um, that are addressed in the report. Um, another set of issues that are addressed in the report relate to screening and surveillance, and we'll hear more about that um, later um, in this session. Um, so one set of issues is under what circumstances is surveillance of private living spaces to identify vector sources ethically acceptable? Um, you have obviously there um, the issue of invasion of privacy. Um, similar set of issues relate to the use of human movement data um, as part of vector control surveillance programs. Again, a very significant privacy concern, um, yet at the same time, the information could be very useful. Um, under what circumstances is it ethically acceptable to disseminate surveillance maps indicating the location of vectors? And there is a lot of discussion in the report about um, the risks that this might impose, not only on people who are um, located in, for example, in houses um, where there are um, mosquitoes present, but for other people in the neighborhood, even if their own houses um, don't have mosquitoes present, is the fact that you live in a neighborhood and you've been identified as living in a neighborhood uh, where vectors are present um, going to um, have a negative effect on, on you, on even on your property values. So that's um, a balancing issue about the benefits of people knowing um, where vectors are so they could avoid those locations versus the um, potential risk to the people whose um, properties or neighborhoods are identified um, in that way. Um, what ethical issues are raised by population screening for vector-borne diseases? Um, under what circumstances can travel screening for vector-borne diseases be ethically justifiable? Um, and then a final set of issues that, that was um, particularly complex um, was how should blood or organ donation programs make decisions about screening for vector-borne diseases in high prevalence settings? Um, one of the issues here was that um, in countries that, that have a, a very high prevalence of a particular disease such as malaria, um, if you screen out all blood or organ donors, um, who have been exposed to, to, to malaria, you may not have any blood or organ donors left, or you may have an insufficient number um, to sustain the needs of a donation program. And so how do you balance out um, the concern about protecting recipients from transmission 
um, against the risk that you're not going to be able to um, have a donation program at all. Um, so those are some of the issues in connection with screening and surveillance. Um, there are several general recommendations um, or, or themes in the general recommendations that I, I wanted to emphasize because these tie together um, many of the issues that are discussed throughout the report. Um, the first um, is, is a general principle that the, that the um, group developing the report um, articulated throughout the report, which is that any limitations on autonomy must be necessary to achieve important public health interests that could not be achieved as effectively and efficiently by less restrictive means. Um, and there are, there are a few points in that um, phrase that I want to emphasize because there's a lot really packed into there. One is that in order to limit autonomy, there has to be um, an important public health interest at stake. Um, it's not sufficient to limit autonomy to say, this might somewhat help um, achieve a very minor um, health-related goal, uh, but there has to be interest of a level of life and death or a severe impact on people's health at stake. And that is going to be triggered in most cases um, with um, public health interventions designed to control vector-borne diseases. But the other piece of that is that the interventions or the limitations on autonomy must be necessary to achieve that important public health interest. If you could achieve the important pu public health interest in some other way um, that, that is less restrictive, then you know all things being equal, you should try to do it that other way. Um, so the limitation on autonomy has to be necessary in the sense that it could not be achieved through less restrictive means. However, there's a further limitation, um, which is that these less restrictive means um, should be as efficacious and efficient so that if there is an alternative to doing it that has less um, of an impact on autonomy, um, but it wouldn't be as effective in achieving the important public health interests, or it would not be as efficient. It would take um, much greater resources, for example, that could um, take away resources from other important public health goals then maybe that isn't an appropriate um, alternative. And in that case, a judgment might be made that it is necessary to use the intervention that, that entails greater limitations on autonomy. So it's always gonna be a kind of balancing process where you consider um, the need for the intervention um, that limits autonomy, um, the alternatives that are available, and then weighing the two to see if it's possible to use the less restrictive alternative and still achieve the same goals in um, as efficient a way. Um, so the standard requires um, quite a bit of consideration upfront um, about um, laying out all the different options that are available and weighing them. Um, and it also recognizes explicitly that it is appropriate or it can be appropriate under some circumstances to use an intervention that does involve limits on autonomy after this analysis has been conducted and the conclusion is made that this is really the, the, the most effective and efficient um, intervention under the circumstances. Um, the second point is that the expected benefits of any intervention must exceed the aggregate, aggregate risks and burdens involved. Um, and and this, is, this is true of any kind of public health intervention, uh, but this must be understood in light of the third point, which is that the benefits and risks of the intervention should be fairly distributed among all segments of society. And so you may have a situation where an intervention on the aggregate, the um, expected benefits outweigh the risks and burdens, but all of the benefits will be felt, uh, will be experienced by one segment of the population and all the risks and burdens by another. So for some people, um, it's all benefit. For some people, it's all harm. And in that case, that would not be a fair distribution. Um, so you need to consider both of these aspects. Is there an aggregate um, benefit that outweighs the burden? And then also, is there a fair distribution? If the distribution isn't fair, um, then that's a signal for the need to reconsider the intervention. Um, it may be um, that in some cases there's no way to achieve um, certain benefits without having a distribution of, of, of risks that is um, somewhat disproportionate um, and that burdens some people more than others. Um, but it really has to be um, considered in advance if there are other ways of doing it. And again, it goes back to the, the first point to look at whether um, you could achieve the same benefits 
as efficiently and effectively um, by means that have less of a um, fairness impact. Um, the importance of community engagement was a point that was discussed um, at length in the report. Um, community engagement means involving the community to ensure that their concerns are understood and considered as part of the decision making process. Um, this is something important in all public health interventions, but particularly so um, in the area of vector borne diseases, um, because as, as I mentioned earlier, the risks and benefits affect large segments of the population and require these community level, uh, population level interventions, but also from a very practical um, level, which is the effectiveness of these interventions um, requires broad levels of public participation. So for example, if you have a campaign to clean up uh, stagnant sources of water in the community and people aren't willing to do it or they don't believe in the, in the value of doing it, it's not gonna get done and it's not gonna be effective. So you need to have community buy-in to uh, many interventions and this requires engaging with people in the community, understanding their concerns and taking them into account as the programs are developed. Um, a few final points, um, other recommendations that are made in the report that I wanted to emphasize. The first is um, that decision makers should be aware of, of the various social factors that are relevant to the risk of being exposed to, infected with, or suffering harms from vector-borne diseases, um, as well as the way these factors intersect in particular settings. Um, there are many social factors that, that are relevant, including, for example, gender, age, socioeconomic status, migration status, um, and it's important to take these into account to attempt to minimize um, additional burdens that are connected to these um, factors and when necessary to be willing to devote additional resources to, um, to making up for these um, burdens. Um, the second point that was addressed in the report that comes out very strongly is the complexity of decisions about genetically modified vectors and the need for a very robust process of risk assessment um, and community engagement um, and a focus not only on scientific risk, but also on social and economic risks in this um, process. And then finally, um, the need for more research on vector-borne diseases and research not simply on the scientific issues about diseases, but also on some of these social, economic, and public health issues, um, and including, for example, what are the best strategies for community engagement about uh, vector-borne diseases, about um, communication about vector-borne diseases, um, how can um, human behavior be better understood in a way to um, understand better the transmission pattern. So there's a need for research, not just on the kind of purely medical level, but also social science research, behavioral research, um, et cetera. So that's a very general overview. And um, you will hear more about many of these issues um, as the program continues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. There was one question that was filled um, in for was not on the question it, uh, that uh, the impact of vector borne diseases and the social status of individuals affecting people who are poorer more than people who are rich, I guess. Um, do your guidelines talk about the social determinants of health and how they can be improved in order to deal with these diseases? Yes, in fact, it's a very good question. And in fact, the guidelines spend quite a bit of time talking about the social determinants of health and how these are really um, the most important factors in understanding uh, vector-borne diseases, um, transmission patterns, and also um, ways that they could be addressed. So for example, there's a, a long discussion about gender and the different ways that the gender dynamics affect um, who is exposed to vectors and how the risks are shared or not, or not shared equally among the population, socioeconomic factors, why, for example, housing is a critical issue um, with respect to vector control, um, that people who live, for example, in houses that, don't, that have dirt floors are inherently more exposed um, to vectors, um, and that's that's um, something that can be addressed only by taking greater efforts to address the underlying factors that lead people to live in houses with dirt floors, which were related to poverty, related to um, 
transportation systems related to issues of um, water and sanitation and all sorts of systemic issues that need to be addressed um, to ensure that people aren't living in conditions that are prone to um, becoming um, grounds for vector transmission. So there's, there's a great deal of linkage there between the social determinants of health and, and vector-borne diseases, and that is discussed extensively in the report. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll take more questions when they come in the panel discussion at the end. Uh, so we move on to the uh, second speaker of the day, um, uh, uh, Professor Joel Ike. Uh, he will be talking about dengue vector control and surveillance ethical concerns. Uh, Dr. Ayek is presently the Director of Environmental Epidemiology at the Environmental Health Institute in Singapore. He is also an adjunct assistant professor at the Duke National University of Singapore Medical School. He has 18 years of experience in public health policy, vector control operations, community advocacy, and scientific research. His interests include uh, assess assessing the impact of environmental determinants on population health and program evaluation. So uh, uh, Dr. Ayek's slides will be run from our end um, uh, in order to facilitate. So I'd ask Swaliha to please assist in that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, over to you, uh, Joel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amir. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who have tuned in. Um, I would like to thank the WHO and CBEC for organizing uh, the webinar today. Uh, in the next 15 minutes, or possibly less, uh, I'll be speaking to you about um, dengue vector control and surveillance um, and the ethical concerns using examples from Singapore. So if you could go to um, the second slide. Um, so this is a summary of uh, what I intend to share. Um, I'll be just um, reiterating the importance of public health surveillance. Uh, what are some of the disease control measures that uh, are used for stopping dengue transmission? Uh, and then thirdly, some of the ethical issues surrounding uh, the use of those control measures. Uh, and lastly, I'll just end off with a really quick summary. Um, the next slide, please. So public health surveillance um, isn't new. Uh, it's been in place since the 16 and the 1700s. And I particularly like uh, this definition of public health surveillance by the WHO. Uh, one of the strong merits of uh, public health surveillance really um, is to help with the um, analysis and interpretation of data. And this benefits planning, implementation and evaluation of public health interventions. Um, as you can see on the bottom right of the slide, um, there are also additional benefits. Um, putting in place public health surveillance uh, allows one uh, to identify areas where there is uh, high risk or heavier burdens of disease. Uh, it helps uh, health authorities manage outbreaks uh, and it certainly also informs policy and practice. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, some of you may be very familiar uh, with uh, vector-borne disease transmission. Um, so this is uh, really a pictorial example of uh, what is required for dengue infections uh, to perpetuate. Um, so over here, we have the human, uh, the dengue virus, as well as the mosquito. Uh, if we remove any one of these components, then we could possibly stop dengue transmission. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, two slides back, please. Yes, that's right. Um, so vaccines would be an ideal form of protect against disease transmission. Uh, but unfortunately, um, uh, in circumstances where it doesn't allow, for example, because we don't have safe or efficacious uh, vaccines available, uh, or resources are constrained uh, and there uh, isn't enough to mount a mass immunization program. Uh, then in countries that 
do not deploy vaccines, uh, vector control remains the primary approach uh, towards disease control. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see there, um, next slide. So in terms of uh, controlling or minimizing dengue transmission, uh, if you can have a look at the top part of the slide, um, we target uh, both the immature as well as the mature stages um, of the Aedes mosquito um, using a variety of methods. Um, so these could include physical methods, uh, simply just removing standing water or removing uh, containers that could accumulate stagnant water. We could also use chemical measures um, such as space sprays uh, and also biological measures, including uh, the use of BTI larvicides. And one novel approach which has been gaining uh, much popularity is the use of Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. Uh, next slide. So regardless of what the um, form of control is, uh, whether it's in combination or otherwise, um, access to homes and premises um, is required uh, in order to discover larval breeding habitats and or to control uh, mosquito populations. Um, so in the next slide, uh, I'll just be showing, um, I think it's one slide before that. Um, okay, sorry. Yep, next slide. So using examples in Singapore, um, I'll highlight some of the ethical issues that could arise um, from accessing homes, um, how Singapore allocates vector control resources across the island, and also I'll touch a bit upon um, on um, the importance of protecting data confidentiality. Next slide. So the picture on the top left um, are public health inspectors in Singapore seeking permission to enter into an occupant's home uh, before a regulatory inspection can be carried out. So in Singapore, we have the Control of Vectors and Pesticides Act uh, that supports regulatory measures aimed at reducing disease transmission. So as you can see in the first uh, blue text box, uh, without the permission of the occupier, uh, no officer may enter the premises. Uh, and if um, permission is initially denied, then a notice has to be served at least 12, 12 hours um, prior to the actual inspection being carried out. And this is done um, so as to ensure respect and ensure privacy uh, in very rare circumstances uh, where the occupant is not home and we have no way, uh, if we've exhausted all means of contacting the, the occupant, then in these rare circumstances, uh, the law does provide uh, uh, an avenue for us uh, to uh, uh, undertake forced entry. And that's uh, provided in section 36, as you can see at the bottom of the slide. Um, now we don't take uh, we 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 don't take such forced entries lightly. Uh, we would have to exhaust all means to enter the premises, uh, and we would also have to place uh, a notice uh, before we can um, uh, undertake forced entry. Uh, now, before we enter uh, premises force, uh, forcibly, uh, we have the police who will be uh, accompanying us, uh, and we make sure that all our officers empty their bags and pockets of any uh, personal belongings before entering the premises. Uh, and all force entries are videotaped from the point of entry. Um, and um, the videographer follows the inspector throughout the home uh, in order to ensure that uh, no possessions are removed uh, from the, uh, the home. Um, next slide. So this slide, uh, I'll be showing you a one minute video uh, on how we try to gain access into homes for regulatory inspections. Some of the challenges that me and my officers face uh, while conducting household house inspection is that uh, we often get scolded for inspecting the house and even more so if when we find uh, mosquito breeding. And at times, even though they are at home, they won't be opening their doors to us. 
we are still unable to access, we will issue Section 35. On the whole, Singaporeans are quite cooperative and helpful and are appreciative of our work, which is what motivates me and my officers. And we also can do our part by doing the Mozi Wipeout. Okay. Um, so, the use of drones has been gaining popularity uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And in Singapore, we've also found a great use for drones. So as you can see in the top left picture, uh, that's one of the models of drones that we use uh, for vector control inspections. And below that picture uh, is the drone controller with a monitor display. And the video feed from the camera mounted below the drone uh, is streamed live through that uh, monitor display. Uh, now, in Singapore, we have very strict rules on the use of drones for regulatory inspections. These drones can only be flown by licensed drone pilots, uh, and each pilot must be accompanied by a safety officer. Uh, no drones can be flown for inspections without prior authorization from the Civil Aviation Authority uh, of Singapore. Uh, and applications for uh, drone flying have to be made um, in advance. So one of the issues uh, of using drones for inspections is that it may infringe the privacy of uh, home occupants. So as you can see on the picture on the extreme right of the slide, um, occupant permission um, has to be sought uh, before the drone can be flown. Uh, and the pilot must take the most direct flight path, avoiding windows uh, if possible. Now, because the video footage is streamed directly into the monitor display, um, this gives um, uh, this uh, gives rise to possible uh, footage that's being captured that should not uh, be uh, due to privacy issues. Um, so, video footage is not retained um, uh, by the drone pilot, and when the drone reaches the point. Uh, where a larval habitat is discovered or there is an infrastructural defect, uh, a picture is taken and shown immediately to the occupant, uh, but it is also immediately deleted um, after that uh, with no video uh, nor still footage um, retained. Uh, next slide. Um, so one of the things that the guidance um, has uh, discussed is um, how um, vector control resources um, shouldn't be discriminatory um, in any sense. Uh, one of the things that we've done in Singapore is on an annual basis, uh, we've used uh, machine uh, learning uh, to develop an island-wide dengue risk map. So if you can see the map on the left of the slide, the darker areas represent um, areas where there's higher dengue risk, and the green areas represent those that have lower dengue risk. Uh, now, all disease control measures uh, in Singapore are based uh, solely uh, on the intensity of transmission. So the areas that will receive the most amount of vector control resources are the ones where the disease burden uh, is highest. And vector control resource allocation is not discriminated in any other way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so. Vector control uh, inspections provide opportunities for uh, data to be collected and how we handle data is very important to building public trust and also ensuring the effectiveness of disease control programs. So on the top left uh, map, as you can see, uh, there are red and yellow zones depicting areas where dengue transmission uh, is occurring. Um, you will note that uh, no specific locations uh, where disease, uh, where dengue infections are reported uh, are indicated on the map. Instead, uh, disease data is aggregated uh, into zones, um, and then they are made publicly available 
uh, on our website. Uh, and that's the URL that you can see uh, right at the bottom of the slide. Um, regulatory inspections also uh, facilitate the collection of uh, data on entomological activity. So if you can see the bottom uh, left um, map, uh, these are publicly available information on areas where there is heightened um, Aedes aegypti activity. Um, again, no specific premises uh, are listed, um, but instead we are careful to aggregate the data. And even in this sense, um, the data is useful uh, to reinforce community awareness uh, and to direct the focus of vector control measures aimed at reducing the um, disease burden. And now for the final slide. So in summary, um, surveillance and control measures, they are important uh, in disease control programs. Uh, some of these activities may give rise to ethical issues. Um, so it's important for us to acknowledge and respond uh, to these ethical challenges uh, because they're essential for building public trust and for disease uh, control programs to work effectively, um, it is essential uh, to have the community support um, and hence uh, public trust uh, must be built uh, to give confidence to community action. Um, with that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Joel, for a very, very good and lucid uh, presentation. Um, so one question that came up was that you talk of public trust, which is extremely important in surveillance measures and uh, buy-in. Uh, what are the measures that have been instituted for the community to uh, buy-in into these measures? People need to open their doors. Um, people need to believe that the drones are actually not looking into their windows and all of that. So how, how have the community engagement processes worked out in Singapore? That is one part. And the other part is, how do you see this playing out in different other communities? Because Singapore is a very special sort of a, uh, a community of, of people who have who, uh, who, uh, bought into this. So how has it happened in Singapore and how do you expect it to happen elsewhere? Um, Amir, thank you very much for the question. Um, so, so in Singapore, um, officers who can carry out regulatory inspections of homes, uh, they cannot do so without the presence of the occupant. The occupant must follow the officer wherever, wherever he or she goes uh, in the home. Uh, and this builds that kind of trust where, you know, the officer is solely focusing on his work uh, and it avoids any uh, potential suspicion uh, on things having gone missing uh, or things having been stolen. Now, uh, we have a, a very strict process uh, where the officer who is responsible for discovering the larval habitat, that it's not the one. The officer is merely the larval specimens, but these specimens are sent to an independent laboratory for verification. So in that sense, there's objectivity, uh, and there is just no, uh, it's just no way for the officer uh, to just determine on site that it is a vector that he has found. Uh, now, in cases where there is a dispute, uh, the officer is not directly involved uh, in the investigation, but there is a separate unit uh, that looks into appeals for alleged uh, wrongdoing or when the larval specimen is not correct, uh, collected correctly. And so that forms that kind of independence uh, that the community can trust uh, that our officers uh, are doing their uh, job professionally. Uh, now, I think it's very important um, for uh, disease control programs um, to build that trust in the community. Now, if the community doesn't trust um, these officers, um, they're just not gonna let them in, into their homes. They're gonna deny entry. They're gonna make it difficult for vector control activities to be carried out. For example, uh, one, of the modes of, um, uh, one, one of the modes of control uh, is to use space sprays. And we can use space sprays in homes. So the 80s Egypti uh, mosquito loves to be in homes. Now, if occupants deny entry into these homes, 
uh, then we won't be able to use these space sprays. So the effectiveness of vector control uh, will be severely limited. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, home occupants, uh, the community have all kinds of ways of uh, derailing programs. Uh, if they don't trust the government, uh, they can make it difficult in, in other ways. Uh, they can give a lot of feedback uh, for governments to spend a lot of resources uh, chasing the wrong ends uh, of, of, of things. So I think wherever uh, 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 the setting is, I think it's important uh, for community engagement to take place um, and for the, the community to really feel um, that um, you know, the efforts really uh, are done, and not to implicate uh, anyone in particular, uh, but really for the benefit of the entire community. Great. So I think there is one more yeah. question. Yeah. So uh, Dr. Faiz Ahmed Raza from Pakistan is asking, how do you ensure privacy in case you see anything suspicious inside an in uninhabited house? And how long are the video records kept? You've partially answered the question, but yeah. Um, Dr. Faiz, thank you very much for that uh, question. So um, before entry into a house, an uninhabited house, the officer is actually searched. So he cannot bring in anything except the tools required to collect the larval specimens and possibly his torchlight. Only one officer enters the house and a videographer stands behind the officer uh, with the footage being recorded. Um, the officer is never ever left out of sight of the videographer. So in that sense, it's a complete uh, video clip of the entire inspection. Uh, when the officer exits uh, the premises, the officer is again searched uh, to make sure that he doesn't have any belongings uh, that weren't already on him uh, before he entered the premises. Uh, these footages, they are stored I, would, I wouldn't say forever, but we, we don't delete them. Uh, so we keep them for as long as possible uh, because we don't know when uh, the occupant uh, may return. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that was a, a good response uh, for a tricky question, all right. So thank you very much, uh, Jewel, for an excellent um, uh, presentation and uh, uh, giving us a very good overview. So we'll move on uh, to our uh, next speaker, Professor Dicky Akemori, uh, who's just joined us. Uh, he will be speaking about addressing vector-borne diseases uh, perspectives of, from ethical reviewers. Professor uh, Dicky Akemori is a regional advisor for vaccine research and regulation in the WHO Regional Office of, uh, for Africa in Brazzaville, Congo. He is responsible for vaccine research, regulation, and safety. He holds a PhD in immunology and prior to joining WHO, he was professor of immunology at the College of Health Sciences, University of Ghana. He has over 150 publications in peer reviewed journals. Uh, so uh, Professor uh, uh, Dikhi Almohri, uh, would you want us to run your slides or would you want to do that uh, from your own end? Well, thank you very much. If you could kindly run the slides from your end, I think okay, that would so, be... So we just thank you them. so much. Give, give us a second. We will be able to do so. Yeah. yeah. And could you turn your video on? Thank you. Yes, I have done so. Thank you very much. I hope you can see me. Um, I'm using a larger screen and the laptop is in a different position. No, but we I can't do see hope you can see. You can't? So, okay. <laughs> At all, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to try and do something about that. Um, Great. Great. Um, yeah, we have a beautiful background and now we've got you in the foreground. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. So I, I really am very, very grateful um, for the invitation to Afro for us to be part of this um, very, very important discussion on, on um, vector-borne diseases. And I'm, I'm making this presentation really in my capacity as uh, a reviewer um, and part of the WHO Afro Ethics Review Committee. And um, so next slide, my intention is to bring to the discussions 
um, the perspectives of, um, of a reviewer on vector-borne diseases. Um, first of all, my entire, uh, most of my, my public health training has focused on some very important vector-borne diseases, particularly malaria, uh, which you know, we've been talking about you know, all this while. So my intention is therefore to just see how can ethics uh, review committees and reviewers in general address vector-borne diseases? Um, what are some of the key aspects of this very, very nicely done um, report that can inform on the work of uh, reviewers. And so I'll try to just say a few things about vector-borne diseases. I'll talk about the core reviewer principles or what guides reviews. I'll look at the key elements of vector-borne diseases. And I've actually identified just three elements. There's a lot to be said about vector-borne diseases, but I've taken three and I see just how reviewers can help to address this. And I'll just conclude with a few remarks. So the next slide, please. Thank you, thank you very much. So um, clearly we, 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 we all know about vector-borne disease. We've heard so many, um, you know, we've heard about, you know, uh, the presentations which have tried to address these diseases. Um, and so I don't want to waste too much time on, um, you know, as if we're preaching to the converted, but certainly it's important to mention that these are a wide range of diseases um, and or pathogens, you know, that affect, you know, a lot of people, um, perhaps uh, more than, you know, more people on the planet than, you know, those who are not really affected. And as much as we, we focus on the key ones that are endemic, we also need to remember that there is also um, the potential for some of these to be uh, epidemics or pandemics. And in fact, we, we just need, to, we, we don't need to go far um, to recall the Zika um, epidemic that we, we had. Uh, next slide, please. So the, these aspects therefore make these diseases really, really uh, important. And as I said, from a research point of view, um, you want to, um, ensure that you, you are able to uh, advance knowledge uh, on these important diseases and understanding of these diseases and to help uh, provide, you know, interventions or tools that are of the highest quality that are effective and safe uh, to help uh, address these diseases, either control them or uh, prevent them where it's possible. And for this to happen, you also need um, regulators and you need ethics committees. You need people who regulate clinical research, who can um, uh, deliver uh, verdicts or who can deliver effective, um, safe and, and, and appropriate uh, interventions because their, their interventions have to also be very appropriate. We just heard about a talk of how you have to get into people's homes in order to collect information which is uh, useful, important for controlling uh, a disease, dengue. Uh, but you know, if we had a better means of doing this, there'll be no need to go into anybody's home. Uh, so reviewers, therefore, um, the reviewers' perspective is therefore important as we address vector-borne diseases. The next slide, please. Now, having said this, there are some principles that guide or which are used uh, by almost every reviewer who does ethical, you know, ethics reviews of any uh, applications submitted for research. And, and among these, uh, the core ones are, you know, to establish that there is some social and societal clinical uh, value. Uh, that the scientific validity, that the science is right, and also that there's fair subject selection. And obviously you want to assess the risk benefit ratio and make sure that it favors, or at least, uh, you know, if not completely uh, the participants. But of course, the review itself must be independent and there must be informed consent. The next slide, please. 
I mean, these core principles uh, are, you know, uh, the, the basis of these core principles really are a number of codes, declarations that we are familiar with, uh, whether they are global, regional, or national. Uh, these have informed these core principles. The next slide, please. But how do reviewers interpret these? Obviously, I think it's important to go into detail how these uh, principles are interpreted. And if you look at the societal or social and societal clinical value, obviously, we need to know that the research in question uh, fulfills, you know, or it merits the risk because uh, participants take a risk. It doesn't matter how you value this, but there's always risk. Also, it's important to look at the relevance, you know, to the society because you don't want to uh, research an intervention which really doesn't fit the society, something that they cannot, you know, incorporate however good it is, into their own values, into their own systems. And of course, there's also the need for scientific validity, and that also comes with a series of questions, some of which I have highlighted here. Uh, the next slide, please. Then there's also the fair subject selection. Uh, and here, again, the science must determine the subjects. I mean, it should not be of a, a, a selection of, of participants based on convenience. Um, privilege, the ease of recruitment, uh, which are often the issues of costs and so on, must never be made the overriding uh, factors in selecting uh, participants. And of course, the favorable risk assessments, uh, clearly this favorable risk benefit must be determined with the evidence from the, the study in question. Next slide, please. So again, independence is critical and I don't want to, to, to dwell on that. And of course, we all know about the importance of informed consent and the need for that process to fulfill its requirements, its fundamental requirements of adequately informing people and giving them the freedom to decide uh, and to accept whatever it is that they're going to participate in. The next slide, please. So again, the respect for potential and you know, selected participants potential because even when you approach communities, we just heard about the discussions around how do you engage communities before you go into their homes uh, to look for mosquitoes. Uh, this has to be done even before the person consents or agrees to participate. And I cannot emphasize this uh, more than I have just done. Uh, next slide, please. Now, Having done this, these are the key elements that I've chosen to just briefly dwell on. Three main things. One, impact. The second, vulnerability. And the third one, uh, access. Because these are key issues. And when you read through the guide, that brilliantly done document, um, these two, three issues come up. Uh, the fact that you know these diseases have such a huge impact on society, on public health, on health and socioeconomic, uh, you know, uh, aspects of people's lives that there's a need to do something about it. Vulnerability, because we know these diseases occur mainly in uh, low socioeconomic status settings, in places where these vectors thrive, and, and often these places lack the, the, um, the, the, um, the this population lack the, the same opportunities as other uh, sectors or other populations. And of course, access, because we are still dealing with these, these problems and we are looking and using such, you know, a variety of tools, sometimes, you know, with very little, um, you, know, uh, you know, impact. Next slide, please. Now, how can, 
how can uh, regulators, you know, or how can ethics reviewers, um, you know, look at these three factors or elements that I have highlighted? And I've tried to summarize that in just three quick slides. One is there's an, an urgent need for, you know, interventions. I mean, no doubt, you know, uh, we know we have, we still have a huge problem with these uh, vector borne diseases. There's also a need for predictability in timelines because when people want to develop products or interventions against these vector borne diseases, they need to have a no, to have full knowledge of the beginning and the end of the process. Then, of course, the burden of diseases, you know, and, and, and deaths, uh, you know, pales in the face of other diseases which tend to have priority over these vector-borne diseases. And of course, the epidemic and pandemic potential of some of these diseases. The next slide, please. So similarly for Vulnerable populations have highlighted some of the key issues that any reviewer needs to look at. They need to look at the fact that, you know, um, the, the, you know the, the, the science must fit with what is being proposed. They need to look at respect for participants. They need to look at adequate information. And of course, they need to look at access to what works best for that society. The next slide. And uh, again, for access itself, obviously, um, we know that, you know, you have to start with basic research, acquire the information, and then you need to move on to where you actually test these. And that's where uh, ethics uh, and especially also regulators come in and the need for them to expedite their, 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 their task, because that would be very pivotal in determining uh, what the outcome will be, whether you end up with an intervention that works, that is safe, that has efficacy to help address vector-borne diseases. The next slide, please. So having highlighted these, I just wanted to, to just go and give the case of COVID-19 and show that indeed, if one were to do this and to prioritize, I think that with that, ethics reviewers can make a difference because we know that COVID uh, has pushed and caused this global, uh, you know, massive effort to accelerate R&D and to come up with interventions. And this has been largely successful. And I think one of the factors of success, one of the key points, one of the key issues which has actually made this successful is because of the expedited review processes. And in the African region, we have what we call the African Vaccine Regulatory Forum, which brings together uh, ethics committees and regulators to work together to expedite uh, ethics and regulatory approvals of applications, especially clinical trial applications. Uh, and they responded, and in the next slide, the next slide, please. Yes, in pushing from what was a regular 60-day procedure for turnaround for clinical trial applications to what they already had 30 days also for an expedited procedure. They went even further to 10 or 15 days uh, for products, you know, depending on whether they are novel, 15 days, or already registered, repurposed, 10 days. And I think this has made a, this made a huge difference and contributed to uh, getting an intervention against COVID-19. The next slide, please. And, and as an example, this is data from a specific review which was done uh, of uh, an application for the use of some antivirals. And you can see that these timelines in days could very well have been in months if they were um, carried out prior to the introduction of this new, uh, this new uh, expedited or emergency procedure. Next slide, please. But also there are examples from around the world of how reviews were done in different countries and you can see them in a matter of days. 
So it is possible to do this. And several countries um, ranging from a few days to up to a week to review clinical trial applications because they were prioritized, because ethics, uh, ethics reviewers, uh, regulators all felt that these were priorities and they wanted to do something about them. And the next slide, coming towards the end now. Therefore, I think that, you know, from what I've said, you can address vector-borne diseases by making sure that ethics reviewers um, consider that these are global public health uh, priorities. And, and that, secondly, that there's an urgent need um, to develop, you know, uh, interventions which work, which are appropriate, which are cost-effective for these diseases. And so ethics reviewers do have a critical role to play in this. And for me, there's a lot that reviewers can do to expedite, you know, procedures which will lead to eventual, you know, development of interventions. And finally, the next slide. In conclusion, I therefore want to um, summarized by saying that vector-borne diseases um, affect the vulnerable. They also have a great deal of impact and we need access to interventions which work. And that secondly, that ethics committees can contribute to addressing vector-borne diseases in the way they prioritize and act on applications which address vector-borne diseases. And we need high quality reviews but in expedited timelines to help address this major public health uh, uh, problem. And um, that's the end of my presentation. The next slide is just to thank you sincerely for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Atinmore, for a very lucid uh, presentation. And you've raised a lot of interesting points. Uh, I think we have uh, some questions that my associate Swalia would like to put forward to you. Yeah, so um, thank you so much, Dr. Dickey, for your presentation. Uh, just uh, just one, uh, I, have, I have two or three questions from, from uh, uh, for your talk. So um, what are some of the ethical challenges while you're reviewing projects related to vector-borne diseases within the African context? So yes, we have the generic viewpoint. But what are some of the real issues which are uh, contextual to the African continent? Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. And, and, and one that, you know, that ethics reviewers on the continent face, you know, on a daily basis. Firstly, for the most important vector-borne disease in our region, which is malaria, um, you know, the ultimate goal has been to develop a vaccine. And although there's one vaccine which is being implemented in the region, in three countries, we still are not there because that's not the ultimate goal. That's not the product that we really think, you know, we should have as the, the ultimate vaccine against the disease. But when it comes to reviewing applications for clinical trials, uh, uh, for instance, of uh, you know, vaccines, candidate vaccines against malaria, we often are faced with products which right from the onset, you can see uh, this is not going to offer the protection that's desired. And, and this, is, this, this is very common because um, uh, researchers, scientists um, have each got an antigen product and they stick to this specific antigen and it's very difficult to convince them and they will tell you, well, they need to collect additional information even though they know that this would not be the ultimate product that will lead to a vaccine that will help to control malaria. So that's potentially, that puts children, and in particular because these trials often focus on children, that means that mothers have to expose their children to a candidate vaccine that they know that is not going to protect their children. And yet we know for the purposes of consent, you have to provide accurate information about the product to the potential participant. And so that's one of the key issues that um, you know, the ethics committees face. There are also the other issue of, there's also the other issue of you know, intrusion. 
studies which require that you, you collect vector information. That means you have to go into people's homes uh, and sit in their homes and try to collect you know, mosquitoes that fly in to try and bite people as a means of doing the vector component of, uh, say, a study. Now, that's not very easy, um, you know, and it's a major ethical issue because you literally are intruding into people's homes. If there were means of, uh, of getting better ways of collecting this data without having people go straight into people's homes, and the intrusive data of this, uh, I think it will also be very, very helpful. But for us in our context also, some of the, um, the, the interventions that people come with uh, are often not appropriate for certain societies or populations or communities. And I think that's also a major issue that uh, reviewers have to look at when they are reviewing uh, applications for research related to vector borne diseases. Thank you. Uh, so there's one more question for Dr. Dickey, then we can move on to the general questions uh, for all the panelists. Um, uh, so uh, in many African and Asian countries, poor people uh, are of course considered very vulnerable, which means that they sometimes cannot refuse, uh, they, that they cannot refuse to participate in any kind of research. How is that issue of inability to refuse uh, how can that? Uh, how is that? How can that issue be ethically addressed? And this is a question from Dr. Inayatullah Meman from Pakistan. So well, thank you very much for the question from Pakistan. A very very important question and one which I cannot adequately address by myself, but I'm sure the other panelists will also contribute to it because for us this is this is really really key. Uh, we're dealing with communities where you know, these uh, vector-borne diseases are prevalent. Uh, communities which lack healthcare, the basic healthcare that other citizens or other uh, communities have in the same country. And then we go, um, we, we studies are designed um, to go to these populations and to try and, 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 and test some intervention or to collect to better understand the disease. And the fundamental question is often, well, you know, you could build a health center here, provide us with what we need, which could quite easily address this uh, public health problem. And you bypass that, you spend so much money, you come in big, big, you know, vehicles, you come and you want to collect information about this disease when you could provide us with facilities that would help us address it. So that's a fundamental problem and, and, and that we face. And so as reviewers, we're often you know, drawn to asking the basic question, what is a societal value? Not just a scientific validity. It may have excellent science, but what will be the societal value? What will be the immediate value to these people, uh, because you cannot use the excuse that we're going to collect more information, which we will share with these people, so they will know more about the disease. That is not an adequate response. And so this clearly is, 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 is a major, major uh, issue that we grapple with. I'm sure the other panelists will also have experiences to share about this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dickey. Uh, so now this question can be uh, answered by any of the three panelists that we have present, present over here. How should one prioritize uh, research and development for a vector-borne disease like dengue, which has a low mortality, but very high burden on healthcare? This is a question from Anna. Uh, I don't know if it's a doctor or not. So Anna it is, <laughs> or thank you. So if any, and if any of the participant uh, panelists can take this question. Perhaps I can invite Dr. Coleman for this uh, response. Okay, so the question is how should, um, should um, priority be determined for... Yes, sorry, when, you... Yeah, I can, I'll just repeat that, Dr. Coleman. Yeah. 
how uh, should one prioritize research and development for a vector-borne disease like dengue, which of course po poses a lot of uh, burden on societies, but has very low mortality. I think what, what Anna is alluding to uh, is that with COVID, uh, with something Dr. Dickey actually illustrated, the mortality is pretty high in some parts of the world, which is perhaps not the case in dengue, which has great morbidity, but very low mortality. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a general question about prioritization um, of resources. I mean, there are, there are various techniques that are used to try to make these comparisons. So, for example, um, um, one way is to look at the concept of quality adjusted life years, where um, there's a mixture of considering um, burdens on quality of life and, and burdens on, on extent of life. And so a significant burden on, on quality of life um, for a substantial number of years um, might be deemed equivalent to um, a lesser burden on, on the extent of life um, that applies to a, a smaller number of people. So um, I think in principle, you could say that a very significant burden on, on, um, on, on health that isn't life-threatening um, could be deemed a very high priority if the burden is significant enough. So it's hard to make a general statement. It really has to be balanced out with what, what else is at stake. But in principle, um, the fact that, it, that it, it may not have a significant impact on, on, um, on, on length of life um, doesn't mean that it isn't a high priority or shouldn't be a high priority. Thank you. I hope uh, that question is answered for you, Anna. One more question from Dr. Mozdam for Dr. Coleman. Uh, so regarding genetic modifications of vectors, so when these guidelines were uh, being uh, drawn up, were there any discussions regarding the possible broader environmental risks as insects play a major role in the balance of nature, or in nature, different species, etc.? Um, yes, that was in fact one of the one of the main areas of discussion was um, environmental risks, and this also goes into the big question of the unknowns because some of these risks are are, are really not known, but um, the environmental risks are, are are among the more challenging ones because it it gets to the question of who is really um, qualified to assess the risks and who is entitled to make a judgment that those risks are reasonable to assume because they're not risks that, that any one person is assuming for, for him or herself, they're risks to humanity, really. And so, um, you know, this, this calls out for a, a more robust process of, of, of community engagement, of risk assessment, but there are just some general questions um, that need to be addressed as to um, whether these are the kind of risks um, that are worth taking in the, in, in the first place. I mean, just to add to what Dr. Coleman said, you know, Clearly in our region, because I know there was a big project to try and um, introduce, um, you know, experimental ways, I mean, uh, mosquitoes which have been modified genetically uh, to try and address malaria. And as you rightly pointed out, yeah, sure, regulators, uh, countries can make decisions, you know, uh, uh, ethicists can make decisions. But at the end of the day, I mean, the intervention is going to be implemented in, in communities and societies. Uh, and, and, and the views of these people also matter, uh, you know, and these should also be considered because at the end, you're going to change their immediate environment, you know, even if it's a limited uh, experiment to try and assess the impact of this. So I, I, I fully agree that, you know, it's not for one person or one entity um, to make that decision. Over. Okay, so there is another question from Professor Bushra Shirazi for uh, Dr. Coleman. Uh, you spoke at great length about the limitations to autonomy. Now, uh, in an intervention in which it necessitates this kind of an intervention to the autonomy of a particular group of people, uh, and the intervention leads to some sort of harm, what she's asking is, is do the researchers uh, or the intervention, uh, uh, the public health folks, uh, owe something to that community because they have been harmed even after the, because of the result of this intervention uh, over and above their own uh, permission to enter? Yeah, I, mean, that, that, I have to say that wasn't an issue that was discussed extensively in this um, guidance, but there are, there are a number of other guidances on research ethics in general, which do address that issue. And um, there's a general agreement that if, um, if, if people who are involved in research are subject to harms, they should be compensated for those.
those harms. So I think those general principles would apply in this context. Okay, I think um, um, we should now turn to Dr. Andreas for some final uh, remarks uh, to conclude the session. We are ending the time that we are allotted. Yes, uh, so uh, I just, uh, we have two minutes uh, on the clock, so I just really want to take this opportunity again to uh, thank our organizers uh, from uh, the Karachi Quadrating Center for Bioethics for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful seminar and also our speakers, uh, Dr. Coleman, Dr. Ike and uh, Dr. Dickey for uh, really laying out uh, these uh, very important uh, issues. I hope we have been able to uh, convey the importance of this rather novel uh, topic, uh, both for bioethics as well as for uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, which is addressing the ethical um, aspects that arise in vector-borne disease management. I think, uh, again, it has been uh, quite neglected in the um, previous years, and I hope uh, with the publication of this uh, document, WHO has uh, contributed to putting this on the agenda. And uh, I also hope that uh, seminars like these will serve to disseminate this important topic in the African region and also beyond worldwide. So thank you very much again to everyone. And uh, yeah. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Uh, thank you for all the participants and the panelists for making this a success. Thank you and uh, goodbye. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.